welcome everyone to uh, the STOA or the pop-up school at the STOA. Uh, Beneath and I haven't uh, figured out what, what technically where we're at exactly, but this is a collaboration of the STOA and the pop-up school. So welcome. And uh, I'm calling in uh, from a hostel in Copenhagen that looks like a spaceship. So if you can't hear me well, or if it's weird colors in the background, that is why. And today's session is a follow-up session on this epic uh, presentation Benita did at the STOA called The Origins of the Self. And this was, was pretty mind-blowing, uh, got a lot of views on, on uh, YouTube and people were requesting, let's, let's have a few other follow-up sessions so we can dive deep into certain aspects of this model. And so today's session is titled The Origins of Self Part Two, From Mine and Me to I and We, and how today's gonna work. Uh, Benita is going to imagine share her screen again or share her thoughts. And then uh, we'll pivot to Q&A in the later half of uh, the session. We're here 90 minutes in total. So that being said, uh, I will give Benita screen share access. And Benita, welcome back to the STOA. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to do a short presentation. Um, this part of the model is um, <clears throat> quite hand hand handable handable it's quite easy to understand um and um um so it can open up into a larger discussion i mean part of the reason why i'm so model oriented is because i think a simple model can help us have complex discussions without kind of losing our way so um yeah so let me just share my screen <clears throat> Uh, there's people in the waiting room. Is that my job? Um, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let them in, uh, everyone in the waiting room, so don't, don't worry. Oh, okay. I didn't know why it was telling me. Okay, so just to orient you, what we're going to be talking about today is um, the development along this line. We looked at this presentation, um, the original origins of the self. So we're going to look at this is a developmental progression. These are di different type of dynamics. So we're gonna look at from mine to me, from mine and me, this kind of primitive structure to I and we. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this, but here is what we're gonna concentrate, this move in identity. And next time we're gonna talk about some of these deeper processes that happen in the core self that are happening underneath this anyways. Um, but we're going to look basically at the identity project here. OK, does that does that make sense? <clears throat> OK, so um, one of the things about um, this model is that um, one of the reasons why I like this model is because it maps onto um, <clears throat> our animal nature maps onto neuroscience. And one of the things we're going to see, just to keep in mind before we get into the, the grid, is that the mind uh, is a uh, identity structure that we inherit from our animal nature. It's associated with what are called egocentric uh, perceptual processing um, systems in the animal body. Um, <clears throat> and so the, like a dog has my bone, my blanket, um, and also my babies. Um, and these are, um, these are subsystems that really um, <clears throat> function semi-independently to the other uh, perceptual processing systems, which are called allocentric. So allocentric is your processing information about the world and how it relates, the world, how, how objects that say in the world relate to each other. And egocentric processing is how the objects in the world relate to me. So egocentric processing is self-referential. Allocentric processing is other uh, referential, other in world. So these, the mind and the me are egocentric self-referencing. The switch here to the I and the we is actually a 
psychobiological switch in your nervous system um, so that this can be, um, <clears throat> yeah, some of this can be tracked uh, in interesting ways. We're not gonna talk a lot about that um, in the next grid, but I just want to, to say that these are, this division is actually in the body. There's an antecedent in the body, in the animal perceptual system that allows this identity project to unfold the way it does. So it's not merely socially constructed. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I don't want that, I want this one. Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna lay out some familiar terms. Some of you may be familiar with some of these developmental terms, um, just so that you can, you can see we're working uh, with a heuristic that can map onto other models. Um, so we have these three big categories, gross, subtle, and causal. I mean them um, mostly the way Terry O'Fallon uses them. Um, and not the way the perennial philosophy uses them. You may or may not be familiar with them. Um, this notion of tier, so you have a pre-concrete level and the first concrete level. Uh, first formal and second formal are part of the subtle levels. And uh, third is, is post-formal. Um, I'm just laying this out if you want to ask questions about it uh, afterwards, that's fine. Uh, just to give some people some orientation, if you know these terms. And now we can look at the identity. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, <clears throat> these terms come from, um, I forget his name, I should have looked it up, but it's, it's, uh, it's from lifespan. These are common terms in the theory of lifespan development. In the first term we have for the identity of the uh, newborn or the child is actor. This is an unfortunate term because usually when we say actor, we think of someone who's consciously adopting a role in a persona. But what this word means at this stage is merely that the identity is the, the body's behavior, the actions themselves are the identity. It's a very um, primitive or very um, early identity. So they call it actor, um, but they don't mean like being a, a TV actor or putting on a persona. Now, um, the next um, term they use is agent. And what I wanna say here is that all the way across this line, something interesting psychologically is happening. What drives this movement is that the child begins to see that they have many behaviors and psychologically that makes them nervous. Okay, these are subconscious or unconscious processes. Um, and so they begin to think, well, then who am I? I must be the agent of these actions. So all across this thing, what happens is the stage you're at, you see, you start to be aware that it's a multiplicity and the psych psyche then wants to be whole. So it creates a new structure, which is the whole over the, the parts. And this happens all the way through until the last level. So at first I'm just, my behaviors, at some point I'm aware that I have more different behaviors, subconsciously, unconsciously, uh, that makes the psyche nervous. I know that's a strange, just story phrase. And so a new structure pop, pops out. I must be the agent, so that's a single structure that is responsible for these actions. So this is important dynamic, to, psychodynamic to understand um, in this model. Um, we can say what is driving this. So, and what drives the behaviors is impulse. And at this point, what drives the behavior is roles. 
So the child realizes that they're the agent over the behavior, uh, agent over the behaviors, and they're very sensitive to how they choose those behaviors, and they're very sensitive to roles. So they really start playing a lot of role playing. They play mommy, they play daddy, they play doctor, and they start to organize their identity around structuring these roles. And a lot of it has to do with like, uh, uh, you see a lot of it, the role playing in terms of um, uh, choice of clothing. So little girls get into all kinds of princess clothes. And then when they're in their princess clothes, they adopt the role of the princess. This is, this is that stage where role is very important. Now, these don't go away. Anyone who's in a career and is their identity is stuck in that role, or if you're a traditional housewife mother and your identity is stuck in that role, uh, you can, you know, this, this very early psychological structure can play a significant part all the way through your adult life. So at this stage, that's all you have, um, but it's important to understand that it's a primitive structure, it's a limiting structure, um, these roles are, are taken from conventional society there and, and we try to fit into the structure or as we borrow it from the definitions of society. And eventually, of course, for most of us, there comes a point where the roles don't, don't work anymore and your kids leave the house and you're just tired of, I've been a mother and a housewife all my life. I've, imagined myself at that. So it is a limiting structure going into adulthood, but it also can persist um, quite strong in uh, the way we, we, uh, way we live our adult lives. The psychological structure here is primary schema. Um, these are, <clears throat> uh, we'll look at this next week. These are how we organize the world into self, other, and world. We organize our experience into self, other, and world, very primary. And here, the psychological structure that begins to be developed in your subconscious are internal working models. If you know anything about internal working models or internal family system psychotherapy, it's because basically your external reality about your agency and the roles and how they work start to become virtualized as little mommies and daddies and children and policemen and doctors inside your psychological structure. Okay, so the, you, the way you're organizing the world uh, becomes internalized um, internally as, you know, imaginative structures about how reality is, that your psyche has the same kind of structures that you're playing out in the world. Um, there is a strong critique about internal family systems in this model because this is also a very early or, or primitive structure. <clears throat> the needs here are for safety. Um, the needs here are for belonging needs. So you can see how this work up, works out. If, I'm, if I go to school and I start to be aware what the role I'm post, supposed to play, I'm supposed to play uh, in front of the teacher, um, then I wanna belong. So I keep matching, I keep uh, matching and creating the roles according to how can I belong in this situation. So again, you can see these are laid down early in life, um, but as we develop into adulthood, um, they should play less and less a part of our psychological structure. The pronoun here is mine and the pronoun here is me. Um, if you have strong belonging needs, you're very, very aware of what, how others are seeing you in the group, how, what your role is to play in order to belong. Um, and you see this is externally driven because um, if you move into a different group, then there's no sense of authentic self. You're just kind of code switching and 
being very uh, sensitive to um, the belonging needs and the roles that is uh, required or fits. <clears throat> Development level, pre-conventional, early conventional, late conventional, we'll just go across this, post-conventional, and then post-formal. Okay, so that sets out the <clears throat> early, the early, um, the mine and the me. And um, then we'll look at the I and the, and then we'll go on to the we. All right, so <clears throat> the subtle level begins to, um, what comes on in the subtle level is more uh, reflexivity, um, more, um, so first formal subtle level are um, things like self-awareness and reflexivity, uh, the ability to ask questions of oneself. Um, the second formal has to do with more, ki more kinds of cognitive complexity uh, in a developmental level. Um, and so <clears throat> that's just what we're going to look at here. Okay, so this is coming to the eye. <clears throat> this is where you see the person again. They see, oh, every time... Every time I'm in a different situation, I, I role switch. So I can be many different roles, all right? So the, the and, and, but this is the killer here. This happens, comes around usually at puberty because what you realize, because the reflexivity here is that the agent itself is duplicitous. So for example, when you're with your friends, your brother, you know, I feel like men are with, hang out with their male friends and women are with their women friends, they feel themselves a certain way and they can role play as that agent. But then usually around puberty, when you start to work with the other, relate to the other sex or the other gender, depending upon what, what situation we're looking at, you realize that the agent themselves is changing. Like, the thing that's that's creating the roles and being sensitive itself changes. And so now you have to create a new psychological structure. So now I'm the author of the agents who structure the behaviors. And this is um, right around, usually around puberty because of this dynamic between male and female and Keegan's work also, you'll see that that that, um, that difference between, um, I mean, literally what happens in your body, you feel like a different person, um, creates this need to have this st psychological structure. Um, so here's where scripts become uh, important. You, you, you're starting to take on one way of <clears throat> showing up in the world, but um, scripts are very important. So, um, you know, social media is all about this, um, what you say, how do you say it, uh, what language you're using in your peer group, you'll have special languages, special memes. Um, and so um, <clears throat> scripts are very important here. The story, uh, the story you tell about yourself, this is all a very storied um, kind of um, phase. And what's important here, your need is for biographical coherence. So you start to have a justification system of my parents were like this. And when I grew up, this happened. And then this happened. And this was formative. And then I went to school. And then I became this. So because you're allowing for much more multiplicity in who you've been over the lifetime, it's very important for you to hold this Biogra biography, this coherence, this biographical coherence. Um, and the, the, it's a need, just like the belonging needs. Um, and um, it, as all needs, it tends to um, constrain us to one story, uh, one long story of who we are. We've always been this way. Um, and so, uh, many people um, are still, I would say, this is a big stage 
a lot of people are still in this. You see in society, everybody's trying to have like the long view of who they are as a black woman or transgender or something, this need to have this script or this, this coherent story about how, how you got here uh, to make sense, sense of things. Uh, I'm gonna say this for Peter because what's really interesting if you journal, if you're, if you're really um, uh, watching yourself create your biographical coherence, you realize how incoherent it is, right? So um, you realize, well, that's how, you know, I read those, that's how I was last year and now I'm this year and there's no real thread. Like, and this will make, the psyche nervous because this is what you've been holding on to. And I have this cool thing I'm going to show you about the nervousness of this face. This is an interview that oh, it's quite old that Jeff Salzman did with Suzanne Cook Gruder. So, where she's talking about this face. Um, what do I have to do here? Uh, I have to optimize for computer sound. So, hold on. I'm going to stop my share. Uh, share sound. Okay. So we'll look at this one first. Whatever I've relied on so far, suddenly it's somewhat suspicious. And then to come to an integration and say, that's fine. That's one of the many ways of how I can be. And so when you're doing that, you're actually operating from a space where you can see your own perspectives. Yes. And where you can enter the ego and say, OK, I'm playing this game or that game, or, or I'm witnessing to the games I'm playing and also the genuine efforts and the struggles and all of that. And that's with a, a little bit of distance. That's a thrilling discovery, isn't it? The first time, yes, certainly. <laughs> and a threat and also a, a disturbing one. Yeah. Because what now what can you stand on? In the postmodernism, you start questioning some of the cultural assumptions, but not yet the fundamental. You still believe that with language and enough methods and all of that, you will figure out what's going on. You're saying in postmodern. Yes, yes, but just more complex yes. than we thought. But now you say, there's nothing I can do. There's really nothing to hold on. So now what? And then when you watch, automatically can't be held as the evolutionary spirit. You great? have transcendent moments. And then you say, ah, there's something else. Right something totally else, a new, if you want a theoretical, a new paradigm. Before it was differentiation, integration, sort of in a very regular pattern, more and more complex, higher and higher levels of perspectives. And now it's something totally different. And okay, so the first one is she's describing this, what can you hold on to? this awareness that the story, you can't, it, language is not going to anchor you anymore. Um, I shouldn't have showed the second clip. The second clip is when we moved to the causal. Um, so, but, but it was one conversation. So this, so now what, right? Even I can't hold on to even the autobiographical coherence. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> That's where we're at. Um, oh, shoot. So now what? I can't even. All right. So we'll go back to that. So um, um, where are we? Yeah, this isn't the best way to do this. Sorry about Yeah, so the autobiographical coherence, we start to see that. She said, we enter into the ego and play this game or that game. And this is, and it's, it's thrilling, but there's a threat. And so now what can I hold on to? Um, 
this is where you start to see, and if you're doing work in these kind of groups or communities, or if you're working with clients, this word self comes in, true self, unique self, authentic self. There's a switch because the person is starting to see this process has not, is, is, a, is part of a larger system. And they can, they're interested in like the Jungian notion of self. You get to switch in pronouns from the I um, or, or the ability to understand that um, I can say I, and then I can say self, and that there are two different ways of identifying with reality. This doesn't happen to everyone in our, in our society. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to people who have not reach this stage. Um, <clears throat> so here's what we call self-author. We become, we want to, this self that is selfing, that is creating these structures, can I authorize it? Do I have the authority to work on it? These are large self-improvement um, momentum here. Um, the driver of self-actualization. What is what is the capacity of this self? What is its true capacity? What, what is its true potential? Um, you start to be a systems thinker. This is more of a cognitive approach, um, but you understand the self is embedded in, in these larger systems. Yes, it's been embedded in the family, the families in the culture. The self is itself a part of a whole. It's a whole of a part. It starts to, people start to, whereas biographical coherence is rather linear, there's this kind of tumbling effect of systems upon systems, the way uh, people talk about um, their psychological structures. Um, and you hear this need for people want to be authentic. Um, <clears throat> so this is a key indicator. People will start to search, well then who I am authentically, who, who is the authentic self? Um, the questions here become large systems thinking, but also they turn to more toward what we would call spirituality because the question is not, you know, easily just described or it doesn't have an easy answer. And the caution here is that this is both a beautiful move, but it's also a trap. Because you notice this move also is looking for the one thing I am, the one true authentic self. And it's the same trap. Eventually you see, it's the same trap. I mean, it's a beautiful phase, don't get me wrong. But as a teacher or a, a mentor, I just lay back and see the same trap. I mean, you're not gonna say it's a, it's a trap, um, but you don't wanna get pulled into sending people on the project to find who their authentic self is, because it's the same trap. You watch the unfolding, it's the same pickle at a much, much more complex psychological stage. And then that's the second video. She's saying, ah, then something happens. It's totally different than all the others. And the others, there's differentiation. And then you, you want to include that by another structure. And then that structure differentiates and you want to include. But this date, she says, is totally something else. And that's the move into the causal. And we'll look at that, <clears throat> um, which again, this doesn't work because, okay. And so um, this, so this move into the causal is um, <clears throat> very rare. I mean, most people are here. Most people work in this in their social and workplace and if they're talking to their psychiatrist, they're, they're, they move into this territory. Um, 
This, we probably know more people in between these two because of uh, the kind of interest we have. This, um, this category is, is quite rare. Um, so let me see if I can. All right, so what's interesting about this category is you start to use the pronoun it. It is working through me, or God is working through me, or spirit is working through me, or nature is working through me. There's this sense of itness. I mean, not like an object, an inanimate object, but you'll start to hear people. The, self, the, the pronoun self has a little bit of that, but you're still identified with the self. And this move, you have this, this movement toward this larger process, the universe is working through me. This whole process has been the universe expressing itself through me. And you see this move toward the it or spirit nature. You'll hear it in your clients. Um, it's the beginning. It's the move from this authenticity. Who am I authentically to, I don't know what it is doing. What, what is, it's just, it is doing me, nature, spirit, God. Uh, I don't know why I did this way. So um, the identity is like a participant or an instrument or a vehicle, or, you know, again, that this, this really, uh, this move is very characteristic. Um, the, you have this driver's purpose, a sense of contribution. You notice in this category that all the other previous categories seem quite narcissistic. Um, it's always in all the other categories, it's always been about you, and now it's not about you. Even self-actualization is seen, comes to be seen as about me. And this in this category, it's like, wow, it's never been about me. <laughs> it's kind of a mind fuck, this category. Um, I don't know, the psychological structures, the structures really aren't there anymore. Um, so just open awareness, um, um, more open participation, open awareness, things aren't held on to. Um, you're not tying up, weaving knots of psychological meaning. Um, so um, they, they, they remain transitional. Somebody asks me my biography, I can recite it, but I don't feel attached to it anymore. So I can go in and play these games, um, but if, and I, I don't really find them living in my psyche. Um, and I don't know, uh, the need is freedom, freedom from uh, the burden of a lot of identity, uh, freedom for having your energy for purpose and contribution. Okay, and we'll just end with, so these are the different eyes. Um, and um, we'll just look at, so any, all of these eyes move into we's, we spaces, but of course the character of the we space is going to be heavily shaped by the identity project of the people in the we space. This is very important to understand. Um, it's, I, it's not possible to get around that. <clears throat> um, so, um, here are our pronouns up here, and here are the we or the collective streams. The, the we's here are um, <clears throat> collective world building, collective agency, right? So true we's are units of agency. Um, they have a world building function. Um, and I put this on a uh, cultural a cultural timeline because the collective is a cultural phenomenon, not an individual identity phenomenon. So in the pre-modern, this is Hannah Arendt's work here. 
In the pre-modern era, uh, our world building activity is our labor, very similar to just, just our behaviors. Um, the characteristic is how we are the same, nature's rhythms. So the pre-modern cultures, um, the collectively are emphasize how we are all the same, the rhythms of nature, birth and death, procreation. Um, this is the world building we of the pre-modern uh, <clears throat> era. Um, and the self-structure in the collective here is constituted by the collective. That the, they are born into a certain reality, your self-structure is pre-constituted by the collective. So that would be a pre-modern we. In the modern era, um, Hannah Arendt saw this move from labor to work, uh, which is a critique of, um, she used it as a critique of Marxism, which um, didn't really perceive this move into the modern era. And this emphasizes how we are different. So we look at like great architects built, you know, built Rome. And um, in, the, in the modern era, you could have a handful of men uh, uh, build the uh, educa higher educational systems of the whole nation, handful of men like the Carnegies build the banking system, handful of men. So the modern was the era of work, not how we are the same, but how we are different. And we uh, imagine the self within this collective as the locus of agency that constitutes the collective, that these great men, and you know why I'm saying men all the time, um, can lay out the fundamental blueprint that the culture then, that will constitute the culture. This is a huge uh, shift in the notion of collective agency. Um, now the modern world is over. It's very, very difficult for a handful of people to institute anything in the world without huge amount of pushback. Um, we get into the postmodern world where the world building activities action and what we mean here is like activist action, uh, speech acts um, and activism. Um, the characteristic is how can we make a difference? So the, how can we make a difference? And the self-structure is the locus of agency that challenges, that changes the collective, doesn't constitute the collective, that's over for the postmoderns, but how can we change the collective? And so you have the rise of activism as a collective we. Now going into the, uh, and so here, this is late conventional I, it's associated with autobiographical needs and scripts. And you can see just how that falls into activism and a lot of what we're seeing today. It's based on this self-structure. Um, who am I? I'm the daughter of slaves, blah, 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 autographic. And this turns into trying to make a case to have certain kinds of action. Then we move into the post-conventional, we're gonna call it that the metamodern age. Uh, now we're beyond uh, Hannah Arendt's work, but I just call it meta-action. Um, and now we see a switch into how can I make a difference? Okay, so there is this tension between postmodern and modern, metamodern. The postmodernists think that the metamodernists are navel gazers because they're not into trying to change culture as a collective. Um, so you have the switch back to how can I make a difference? Um, and the self-structure begins to be understood as the locus of transformation that evolves the self. So this is a big part of game B and the move away from this activist politics kind of uh, world building action um, and switches back into um, toward the self, trying to understand the self. How can I self-author myself such that e that evolves other selves? And in this last formation, I don't know what do you want to call it, integral, as Gebser thought of it. Um, there's a more of a what wants to emerge is this switch to 
I'm not in charge. Can I listen? Can I be sensitive to what wants to emerge? And we begin to see the self-structure as the locus of transformation that evolves the collective. Doesn't change the collective, doesn't constitute the collective. We don't know where the collective is going, but can a person be a force of transformation such that the collective shifts? And this would be people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, just by the sense of their presence, things shift around them. They're not going in and constituting it. And, um, and people that have that kind of transformational self usually, or the model predicts, are in this relationship with spirit or purpose that is not an individual identity. So hopefully that helps make meaning and um, I should post, should post the, uh, the grid somewhere. Um, yeah, does that, does that help in any way? Does it, does it help organize some of uh, this complex territory of where we are and where we've been? Yeah, that was uh, super, super helpful uh, seeing that chart uh, and laying it out. Uh, it was quite informative. Um, and perhaps you can share your, the PowerPoint so we can kind of post it with the video in the, the pop-up school. Uh, so you cool to pivot to some questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so either put up your hand or just put some thing in the chat and I'll call on you. Um, I guess my first question is the whole, whole like, you know, the phenomenology of the we, how it's experienced through each kind of identity structure. And uh, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, and then the whole we space movement, how does this fit into it? Like call it all the intersubjective practices that we are playing with at the STOA, like collective presencing, circling, how does it inform, um, you know, us to get more sophisticated with certain kind of identity structures? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you could do, a we space or a psychotechnology workshop on identity structures. The, 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 I mean, I think that there is power in seeing a model like this, but again, it's descriptive. You know, it's we have to be careful because if we try to learn ourselves into a new identity structure, it's it's not necessarily lived, a lived thing, right? So we have, for example, a bunch of you know, you, you, you learn what, you know, teal is, and then you start to play the role of teal. It's a role structure, right? And you show up as teal amongst other groups of people who wanna be teal. And from my perspective, you're in the me and role identity of teal, right? Does that, did, does that make sense what I just said? I mean, it's a very, it's a very primitive structure. And you would say, in my opinion, I would say no progress at all. In fact, uh, a case can be made that a lot of what we track in developmental theory, especially like in spiral dynamics when they're tracking your behaviors, is really just someone moving from role structure to role structure to role structure with bigger benefits or status in a certain culture. But if you're related to that role along that pipeline that is served, right? So if I move like education, higher education does that, wants to move me from a farmer to a coder. And to be coder, that's not really a move. Uh, that's not really progress if you're just in the identity role of a coder. And so, we have to be careful that the form uh, the person's taking is not just more sophisticated because it's been laid out. Uh, it could be literally a primitive role, a primitive, um, that primitive structure of agent and role. Um, curiously enough, it's also the, the stage at which internal working models are very important. And curiously enough, a lot of people in the circling really like to work with internal working models. 
Um, so I kind of, it's kind of interesting to me how predictable the model is across some, some uh, psychotechnologies. It doesn't mean it's not important, it's important, but um, it's certainly not very sophisticated along, along the path of, uh, yeah, into like a meta-modern or a meta-action. Um, the other uh, question I had, um, so um, I had this coffee with this Danish philosopher who wrote the, the Nordic Secret. Uh, the other day, uh, Leanne Re uh, Rachel Anderson, yeah. she talked about the, um, the you know the build on and it kind of maps over the, the framework that she uses there. Like there's like self governing self and there's like the self authoring, um, and there's like a system. And she she wants you know the schooling to to have that and it kind of lost that that kind of educational structure that affords people to move across the spectrum, um, but it's still happening in an informal way. And there's just kind of like points that people have, sort of like the what I'll call the authenticity uh, authenticity gap, where there's like their, their societal role is, is like kind of interfering with what's their you know deep calling, uh, and then perhaps another point is like the uh, authenticity trap, where there's like just like this kind of longing for the to go beyond the self and find the you know kind of connect with the we. Um, so I'm curious what if you can kind of talk about those points and how to overcome them or kind of release the tension there or feel into the tension to get to the next uh, identity stage. Yeah, I would say that the you know this the self is going to do what it's what it does create structures, um, but I would say that the focus should be on the developmental field that the self is in. I mean, and so for example, um, uh. Well, then of course you have how you're going to change society. You know, it's like a back and forth. You know, if if, if um, I think where we're at right now, I think what Lena's work is and meta modern work is um, primarily work on saying, you, you know, we want to evolve the self so that the world building activities of the leaders are structure structure new ways of being human. Um, so, uh, that's, I think, where we're at in history, um, and I would say that that's a long game, and it seems very frustrating. Um, you know, it's not something you can teach, because basically, the self is, is, is a process, right? And it's going to take the shape. In many cases, it's going to use the affordances and take the shapes and, and struggle with perverse incentives and be seduced by perverse incentives. And those are the external world, the built environment. And I think, you know, you said you're in like Denmark and you can feel what it must, how different it may feel like to grow up in Denmark, that it would, it would be structured in a, in a different different way, um, but we live in the society we have, and we do have all these internal structures with most people at this point in time. And um, I think using a model like this is just to be very careful that you're not inadvertently uh, reifying structures you would hope people would move off of. Um, and um, and I think when we, when we know too much about developmental models, we can ape them really well and pretend we're moving when, when we're not. Um, it, you know, someone said, I think all of these are operating all the time. Yes, they are. Um, under stress, you know, you can feel really strong belonging needs. Um, but, um, you know, this model is controversial because it says belonging and safety needs are not highly evolved. It's not a highly evolved psyche. And the whole culture of psychotherapy wants to keep re-emphasizing safety and belonging. And, and, and um, so you may be working with safety needs and belonging needs, but it's to me, it's not advantageous to keep 
saying that every time you sit down in we space practice because these are these are very primitive structures they're set down before you're in the subtle level before you can actually organize reality through very more cognitive ways right so um uh yeah there's it, it problematizes the question of trauma you know whether and we're going to look at early that underlying thing about early childhood experiences and why do we have safety and belonging needs for so long? Is it because our childhood is traumatized or is it something else? So we got to look at that, you know? Um, but that's those are the questions the, the model uh, brings up. It is a controversial, it's quite controversial relative to, it's not popular culture, but I would say more the uh, mainstream thinking in these, in these these groups. Awesome. Uh, so we'll pivot to the, uh, the questions in the chat. Uh, Katharina uh, first and then Zoe. Go uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Katharina. Can you mute, unmute yourself? That's great. No, you can't. Okay, that's why. Uh, you can unmute yourself now and then Benita just got muted by accident. Hello, Bonita. Thank you for your uh, really good overview. Um, I posted a question in the chat, um, but I can also just uh, reword it, which is that I think there might be a danger, especially in spiritual, uh, spiritual circles, to confuse the formal and the post-formal stage. And I was wondering, um, what, what your opinion is about um, emptiness teachings um, in helping or in bringing about the post-formal stage, um, kind of showing that the self is a dependent arising. And um, because personally, I feel that is a deep or not I feel, I, I intellectually, I think I haven't um, made these deep experiences, but I think this is a, can be a pitfall in a lot of spiritual circles that there is an idea of, of an it and the it is the doer. Um, however, the, the experiential level is lacking because there are no or not enough, not sufficient uh, insights into the emptiness of the self and of all things. And I would just, yeah, that's kind of the, the angle I'm coming from, from, from a meditative uh, viewpoint. Thank you, Bonita. Yeah, it's, it's a... Um... <clears throat> There are certain character. Okay, so I try to talk about. I love the way you talked about the emptiness of the self. There's an ontological emptiness that I have a strong critique against. Um, but yeah, the emptiness of the self. Um, th it's tricky because you can have a state experience or an insight into the emptiness of the self. Uh, but if you still have psychological structures, you're not there yet. And of course, I can pretend that I don't have these structures by repressing them, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they're not actually resolved and released. Um, so um, I would say that one mechanism is to understand the felt sense of these structures in your body and um and um notice that um the the that the experience of emptiness of self is not arising <laughs> in fact the experience of role and belonging and what do I look like and it is arising. So it's always is the experience of emptiness of self arising or is it not? Um, it's not whether it's an idea that you can kind of get a theoretical glimpse of it. Um, and also I think um, if more people could talk about 
what does it feel like to live in a body where the psych there's really very little psychological structures um, basically that's your measurement what does your body feel like you can understand the potential emptiness of the self but if you have <clears throat> psychological constrictions then em emptiness is not arising in your body Is that helpful? It's a tough question. So um, it feels a certain way. First of all, one of the characteristics is very funny because you're just like, oh my God, it's never been about me. Like literally it can be the cosmic joke. All the work you did in the subtle level to control your inner environment and work, it was all very narcissistic, right? This is what it feels like at the end. Um, um, so there's key characteristics, but it feels different, you know, like I remember thinking the way I, I relate to it was in the, in the gross level, everything you're involved with is external conditions, causes and conditions. If only I had more money, if only they didn't yell at me, if only my parents, you know, like it's always about external causes and conditions. And then in the subtle levels, you start to realize, oh, if I can control my inner causes and conditions, change, it's a game changer. So I call that, you feel like you cracked the code. It's very powerful. In the, th in the last category, even that seems ridiculous, hopelessly narcissistic. Um, so, uh, yeah it's 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 a very big shift um and you see it in teachers like T I don't never, never know how to say his name Thich Nhat Han, when he stands in front of a bunch of students and they say can you give us one word of advice and he says get more sleep you see that's when you hear people like that this is in that category like, and he says it with such Dalai Lama. I mean, he's like, he, he's laughs all the time. Like, he's not about trying to change anything. Like, uh, yeah, so that's what you see in, in, in that kind of, uh, in that category, let's say. I mean, these are stereotypes, but uh, they're also markers. Thank you, Bonita. Thanks yeah. for the question. I hope it's... Yeah, it's a big question. Zoe, uh, if you can ask your question next. Hi, it's Zoe. Hi. Hi, Zoe. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, first, thank you. And um, it's really useful. And my question's more about like this, this feeling of those things simultaneously you know and that kind of sh shifting maybe between stages and conversations with the self between different of these stages and yeah and also a kind of like a little bit this feeling um sometimes that we we tend to make a kind of ladder or a hierarchy of that thing and that kind of push towards this evolution is like pushing us towards a point where we aim for that and maybe that's where some of those that acting kind of takes place when actually there's someone aiming to get to causal you know I want to be causal because that's the best thing yeah. <laughs> you know and I I was sort of noticing that and I was wondering if if making it a linear model is really if there's another if, a, a way that's not linear to think about this that's not yeah. about i'm evolving but as in like it's all part of my being simultaneously in different levels different amounts different grasping of it yeah so most of us experience them all playing their role <laughs> um but some get quieter and quieter 
and we we less uh, interested in them and others come online stronger. Um, now, what I want to say is this is just the developmental line of the model, which is why it's linear and developmental. But remember, the whole origin of the self has three legs, three. The self actually grows dynamically in a, in, as expansion across three domains, and the other two domains are not developmental. So yes, you're right. This is the the portion of the whole, I mean, I don't know how to talk about the whole thing all at once, um, but this is the developmental trajectory. Uh, we're gonna look at the core self it, next time. It, it's not a developmental process. It's not, but <clears throat> part of our experience is developmental. Part of it's evolutionary and un evolutionary unfolding. Part of it is just being in action and in, in feedback loops. So um, yeah. So this happens to be that part of that dynamic in the self, and that's why it's exclusively developmental. But you're right, it's, yeah. But there's not a sense of transcend and include. Uh, once you're out of the stage of role, they're not, you could take up a role, but it, it just, like Suzanne said, it's like a game, it doesn't, doesn't have any real meaning or doesn't seem like it pertains to you really. Um, it's like when I get pulled over by a cop, like I take up a role that's literally not me at all, but just for like to get it over with, you know? Um, so, But it is developmental. This this particular portion of the whole uh, scheme, the whole model, is the developmental portion. Any follow up, Zoe? Just digesting. Thank you, Juanita. Yeah. The model is an attempt to not not describe the self in in only in terms of developmental. Um, but we have to include um, that there is an aspect to change in the self that is developmental. It's also, you know, so yeah, good question. Good noticing. Shayla, uh, if you could ask your question next. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. And yeah, it's beautiful to feel all the questions that are cohering in this space right now. And so mine, which other people have echoed, is about, I, I feel in a lot of the groups I'm in that I co-facilitate, like these, these stages are all, you know, happening together, popping up, then disappearing. And I, I, I'm, I feel very frustrated right now because there's so little clarity in the we spaces. And so I was co-facilitating, trying to co-facilitate a group recently in which, you know, that question of what wants to emerge is coming up strongly, but it's still entangled in more primitive ego structures, which is fascinating to me. So a, a group of us decided to, you know, engage that question and I was one of the main facilitators and I shut the group down because I, I saw, I've never done that before, but I could see that people think they're engaging that question and part of them is, but then their identity structure comes along and grabs it and they're wow. not, you know, and, and they're not really asking the question on the level that you're talking about and I, I couldn't sort it out because I didn't know how to bring enough clarity so that we could see what was going on. And I see that in all sorts of other we spaces too, like that there's so much confusion because we're not able to, to say to someone, oh, you're engaging that question from a, a, a very fixed identity and then the whole the whole we space collapses or fragments. 
does this make yeah sense? yeah i mean because everything's in play at the same time we have a indication of this notion of of letting go and seeing what wants to emerge but there's social anxiety and, and a lot of stuff happens with bodies in space um but one of the things that this may or may not be helpful is what i learned through my own experiments was that um <clears throat> So you notice I, I put collective we's as world building. And I think that um, we space practice as a psychotechnology is interesting up to a point. I think it's um, problematic if you're not doing something in the world. And when you actually take up a project with a group in the world, the world will ground some of this problem. You're focused on the problem, so some of these other structures don't play such a big part. When you're only doing we space practice, it's highlighting the psychological structures. And, and so um, asking the question what wants to emerge is not a real world project. That's amazing that you're saying that, Bonnie, because I've been involved um, for the last four months. A group of us have been <clears throat> bringing a woman out of Afghanistan. Um, and it's been an incredibly intense project. There's been a lot. It's just been very challenging. And I noticed exactly what you're saying. Yeah, because that's a real project. It could but be as simple as that. Take one woman and get her out of trouble. But yeah. you see, it's already allocentric. It's already world facing. And I believe this is the problem. We had great struggles with our we space practices up and down, just like things people complain about. And then it started to cohere and we had these fantastic metaphysical insights. And then after we drank champagne and we shut it down because we realized the metaphysical insights was infinitely high play could go on forever and it was meaningless in the real world so that's my oh, yeah, experience that. yeah because it's fun when that happens um but you're right the world can ground like just simple service in the world with a group of people is the way to develop intimacy in a we space oh, and, that's and to get rid of your ego and to yeah. look at these psychological structures through the work that's why in my model, I put it as world building. Well, that, that's amazing because I started to notice in the past few days, because we're at such a critical place with this woman yeah. and she's actually in danger, that all of us, like things will come up and I realize that's irrelevant. Like there's a true natural transcendence that happens. Exactly. And, yeah. And that's through the world. The world is the transcendent phenomenon. I, I believe that action is the only transcendent phenomenon. Everything else is imminent. Action's transcendent because you don't know what you do. You don't know what the outcome is and you have to choose anyways. In my opinion, that's the only transcendent aspect of, everything else is false conceptual transcendence. Everything else is imminence, but action is the transcendent element. So Thank yes. You. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we're saying the same thing. We're we're noticing the same patterns. I would suppose an action could be like traveling the world together. That puts a tremendous like traveling together puts a tremendous amount of the same kind of where the rubber hits the road. So it doesn't have to be like you know, but it, but it, it should be something. Yeah, I'm sure Peter's noticing that these days. <laughs> A little bit. Um, so thank you, Sheila. Uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, Keith, Keith, you had a, a question in the chat. Yeah, um, as an older generation person, um, looking at, uh, the, the fragmentation across generations. Um, I'm really concerned about, for instance, people who are not yet economically feeling empowered. And so they're taking alternative ways to exercise some sort of voice in the world, world, world building in a way, but through activism, which is often very confrontational and very frustrating is my interpretation of it from 
And um, so this brings this whole question is how does it relate between people at different stages and groups in society that need to speak together in order to bring about really collective transformation. And of course, then there's a the whole uh, thing about uh, traumas from the older that are inherent in the older generation that are held and silent because we don't talk about them <laughs> and what that does to the younger generation who are living in their bodies but don't know where it came from. Shame, uh, violence, uh, you can name it, sexism, the whole list. <laughs> So it's complicated, but I'm really curious about how your model yeah. works with this. <laughs> we'll talk about shame and trauma next time. We have to because it's 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 not developmental, um, and it's a very big topic, and it's almost all we're going to talk about next time. Um, but in terms of uh, <clears throat> activism, and you know, it's no coincidence that, for example, Perspectiva uh, released a book called Entangled Activism. And Indra Anon is talking about uh, post, I forgot what she calls it. Like there's a lot of people that are reflecting back on, then these people have been activists and they're reflecting back on where is activism today? Where does it live in the world building project? What went wrong with it? How it's complicit in the very things that it's been fighting. Um, so you do see this, this reflected reflection emerging from the and and of course the tension between activists who are really uh yeah i mean i had the you know zimbabwe liberation front army in my uh studio when i lived in san francisco and they were doing a you know uh, they had a festival down at the oakland uh communist center and i mean i mean I've been there, you know. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I I sometimes work myself into a frenzy in terms of the 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 me the me structure is huge on social media. It's it's just a huge reinforcing this me structure and belonging and status and. How do I look relative to the other person? And it's disembodied and it doesn't have anything to do with the world. And uh, it lives in the me structure, it lives in the psyche, which has infinite potential to infinitely complexify. <clears throat> and um, there's so many different me's threaded through all these different kind of cis, straight, white, trans, you know, like this is just hype the me on steroids in our culture. Um, I don't know. Maybe the structure will exhaust itself. You know, that's also true. There's a developmental progression, but we also see that some, some things in life of the psyche and the mind um, get like ramped up and then the, the structure exhausts itself and then it's just about gone. So that, that some of these things evolve because they exhaust themselves. Uh, that could be happening also. Um, the mind is like that. Like if you really, you can get a breakthrough by hyper attentive introspection of a question until you pop out the other end, right? Versus just calming yourself down. So there are some, there is some reason to think that these structures exhaust themselves, that they don't actually necessarily move through society developmentally. Any uh, follow up question or shares, Keith? I think I'll meditate on that for a while. I'm, I'm not have, finding uh, coherence in, in what, I, what I'm seeing. So I'll, I'll just sit on it for a while. And wait till next time. It's not in this session. Thank you very much, Ami, for this beautiful work. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, I think we might have one more question in the chat. Uh, Aslam, uh, do you still want to ask your question? 
Well, the timing uh, may not be perfect for this question, but uh, I was wondering if uh, if uh, all dimensions that you've shared with us in prior session and this one, and maybe there will be more, uh, flowing in between those as consciously as possible while building is possible something, is this something teachable? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I go through phases. I've been teaching this for a long time. And sometimes I go through phases of tremendous despair. I just had a weekend with my class that threw me into despair. I wasn't on this. We've done this earlier. But um, yeah, it makes me wonder. Yeah, why bother at all sometimes? And then sometimes it seems to, I get someone, I mean, sometimes people write me and they say I saved their lives because they were just on this path and then all of a sudden it was crystal clear. Uh, so if it's teachable, it's not reliably teachable. Um, but it's funny you ask that because I just, I, you know, you had asked me on Sunday night after my three day intensive if any of this stuff was teachable. Uh, I would have been started crying. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, it's tough stuff. You know, it's after all these years, it's it's interesting to be on a public venue and, and share it because it's always been in very small dedicated uh, cohorts. Um, yeah, it's use, I would say it's useful, but not teachable, right? It's useful to, as, to organize, um, but if you just teach it and people then say, well, oh, then it, you, we're back to that problem where people are imagining themselves moving through these, these structures. <clears throat> Uh, um, not at this point, but I think uh, in terms of horizon, it's just such a long term uh, thing, learning such thing, uh, meander and embodiedly experience all these places uh, to be able to even consider being hyperfluid ideally or possibly <laughs> in action so i don't know but yeah um i think that um i think you know we're not by no means am i saying that the world be saved if everybody moves to this this kind of identity structure i'm just saying if you want to understand the mess that's going on in the human system, it's very messy and complex, this is helpful, right? And um, and I think that um, it may be helpful so that people, um, they have a sense that this isn't working or a sense that something's not happening and this may help people understand part of that wherever they are um and uh yeah and it also serves as a critique on methodologies that i think are confused about uh what about uh what is what is the uh, non-egoic potential of the psyche and, and what isn't. Um, so some of these problematic we spaces, I think could be helped by a different understanding. I mean, it's just one, one model out there. Um, there's obviously disagreement. Um, you know, JJ's asking whether there's different pedagogy um, I, I don't, you know, I don't think I'm very good at <laughs> what I do. Uh, so I think that, you know, um, 
there's probably many more different uh, pedagogies that could make the learning easier. Not only pedagogy, though, but also like, actual, yeah, the, like this whole like learning environment and like, kind of the spaces that people are in, the kinds of, yeah, just, I mean, have you like noticed like patterns around that where, yeah, certain, certain environments that people are in that like, allow them to have these insights a bit easier? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, you know, we're at odds with many, much of our educational institutions in terms of how they deal with some of these, these uh, structures. We're at odds with the trends in movies and TV and how parents raise their kids. Um, and it's not that kids shouldn't go through a phase of role, but then it gets overly reinforced um, um, the difference between someone understanding as a parent that this is an early phase and you're open and supporting the journey or the fluidity versus a parent who uh, over praises and is part of the whole reinforcing a, an early structure. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that can be, that's an interesting question. Um, but we're going to look at, you know, the role of parents is even more fundamental than, than that. Uh, we'll look at that, the, the, the journey of the core self is not a developmental journey. Um, we'll look at that next, next time. I think next week, I can't remember when I'm back. <clears throat> Actually, and just just with what you said, something that because there's thinking about okay the effect that the parent has on the child. But like say I was thinking about okay when you're in relationship with um, okay say say that parent child dynamic where the child is much more focused on the role than uh, say a parent is further along that line, right? And having to stay in relationship with someone who is very focused on on the roles and like kind of that strong need for them. What effect is that having for someone say, yeah, like the parent that kind of further along? Like not and then not just in a parent child child dynamic, say in other dynamics where again one person is very, very focused on that role and it's becoming less and less of a thing for another. Um yeah, is it like a, a mutual back and forth call like, going on? Um I mean, I think there can be a conflict within the person themselves, right? Like if you're a role, if you've been told to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, um, that's a heavily role-based expectation. Um, and um, so psychodynamically, you may feel that there's something wrong all the time. You may be exhausted by your job because it's not, it's not, something that you know, doesn't give you back energy because it's 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 stuck in this role expectation that is on the one hand uh, easy to understand. I mean, it's easy to understand yourself. This is my career, this is my role, I go to work. So in a sense, it's a it's a it's a shorthand for getting through life because um, you're but on the other hand, if you're kind of you know, it's eating away at you and you feel unfulfilled. Um, maybe that's something to pay attention to also. So um, in terms of between people, um, I don't think there's that much conflict. You probably have friends who are just stuck in a role and they're just, you might say, how can you just go to work every day like that? And basically they kind of like say, it's easy. You know, I make money, it's easy. And there's usually not a lot of A lot of conflict there, except if you're in a relationship, right? So this is very uh, big in uh, if you're in a intimate relationship and you have a, a family, for example, you may find uh, you both started out <clears throat> with strong subconscious or unconscious role expectations, and one person doesn't want to 
it's not them anymore, right? This could create a lot of that. That would be something that would have a dynamic between between people, for sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jacqueline. Uh, we'll have to close soon. Um, Cheryl does have a question about. Uh, I'll just read it. Uh, any kind of recommendations on accessible like media or art that expresses the elite to post formal consciousness? Uh, the example she uses is uh, Arrival and, and Doom. Yeah, you probably answer that better than me. I mean, that's a very fascinating question. Arrival, yeah. Um, uh, art, hmm. that's interesting. I'll think about that. Like what, what art, um, uh, I know there's a lot of art that wants to reflect that, but it can look, most of what I see can look like new agey and it doesn't have this, this, um, uh, um, I would say uh, Ronin. I don't know if you you you're watching Ronin on on Twitter. I am Ronin. He's reading a very very ancient text and doing um, using Christopher Alexander's process to paint these forms that reflect back to him, and they look like uh, paintings from Hilma at, of Clint. Um, I think I, I think if that. I mean, he'd probably be embarrassed that I'm saying this, but I think that they qualify. Um, his relationship to the ancient texts and the Alexandrian approach is really the, you know, and he's not a painter um, and he's letting that process through him. So that you would, I, I see it in his work. <clears throat> it's very simple work. You wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily just see it and say, ah, that's what was happening to him. Yeah. Very cool. And I think someone might post a post session Zoom link here. So if you want to jump on that, you can continue this conversation. Um, but I'll have to close this down. Uh, Benita, any words you'd like to leave us with, perhaps setting up uh, next time you, you come for part three? Yeah, so part three will look at the deeper structures of the psyche, the core self, trauma, attachment, uh, affect regulation, early attachment. Um, we'll try to try to see how that works. That's underneath the identity project, right? It's a deeper, uh, it's, it's, it's more primordial and more uh, subconscious or unconscious, and it's not a developmental, it's a very messy. It's a very, it's a, it's a very messy process. And uh, so I'll post some announcements where you can sign up for that in a moment. But uh, Benita, thank you so much for coming again. Uh, knowing that someone like you is out there uh, teaching this stuff at the nice edge of all these models, um, you know, makes me less likely to despair. So uh, uh, thank you on behalf of the, the STOA and uh, I imagine the pop-up school students as well. And so the next session is on the uh, November 24th at 10 a.m. Uh, ET. It's a still a Patreon or pop-up school session. Uh, and I'll plug two more sessions uh, that's happening at the STOA. Uh, Ken Wilbur is coming in on the 22nd. Uh, Benita, uh, Zach Stein, uh, Gail Bradbrook from Extinction Rebellion will all be asking Ken questions. Uh, if you'd like to come live to that, that's 4 p.m. Eastern time on the 22nd. It's a still a Patreon event. And in about 30 minutes, we have Peter uh, Koenig, Koenig, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, uh, Money Work. It's all about this cool process of getting right relationship with money. Uh, you can just sign up uh, on the store that's here, the link right there. Uh, so that being said, uh, Benita, everyone, thanks so much for coming to the store today. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed the questions. <laughs>